What is going on, Mr. Tom Nash? I am so grateful you're able to join me today, the community today, because there's a lot of serious things going on that I think you're yeah. actually abnormally positioned to explain to the audience. So before we get into the craziness that is geopolitics right now and the insanity with Russia, Ukraine, what's going on with Elon, the US, um, first to the few who haven't heard of you before, can you quickly give us an introduction of who you are and what you do and maybe why you are so well positioned to speak on this topic? Yeah, I'm right down the middle since uh, my family comes from Crimea which is kind of the disputed area where Russia and Ukraine is feuding about. Uh, my family is uh, ethnically Russian, and they came from Crimea. There's certain people who are ethnically Ukrainian who live in Crimea, and that's a little bit hard to understand for, for the American audience. But, but I came from that area, but I'm ethnically Russian, and still I sympathize and identify with the Ukrainian people and absolutely despise what's going on on the Russian side. So that's where I stand on that. Man, I'm sure just life itself is hard enough, but I'm sure over this past year, just with you still having family members in the area, seriously, yep. my heart goes out to you. Just I'm sure tensions like every day, you just don't know kind of what's going on. And all of a sudden it's awful in February, then things calm down a little bit. And it seems like we're right back to like, literally as of the time that we're filming this, uh, we have air strikes, we have cruise missiles. Like it's just, I'm sure it's tense time. So seriously, my thoughts were with you and your extended family over there. Um, I do want to get into Crimea. The recent news was a couple days ago, the bridge was attacked and yep. then we see some retaliation. But even before that, at the end of September, not that long ago, we see Nord Stream being sabotaged. And it's almost like that Spider-Man meme of like everyone pointing at everyone of like yeah. who's going on. But now fast forward just two weeks. So a couple days ago, if you please give us a rundown, I'm sure you know the timeline a little bit better than I do. But I believe a day, day and a half ago, um, a bridge that seemed to be strategically important was basically sabotage, no more. And then as of today, I do have some commentary from Putin, and I just wanna get this right. It is simply impossible to leave such crimes unanswered. If attempts to carry out terrorist attacks on our territory continue, responses from Russia will be tough and will correspond in scale to the level to, of threats to the Russian Federation. Then a little bit after that, like I said before, airstrikes and also cruise missile attacks infrastructure is being attacked two important cities actually more than two important cities just now before we started filming this over a dozen i guess u.s airport websites were hacked by russian-speaking hackers so clearly tensions are at a boiling point for the audience especially who maybe we don't get the culture and the i guess mixture of what's going on between russia ukraine um i think just your insights could be very very helpful so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy to say that, but uh, we've been at this for 229 days. Wow, of war! Imagine, like it's it's kind of seems like it just started yesterday, but we're closing in on a year almost of this. And you're right. Um, on October 8, the only connection between Russia and the Crimea Peninsula was sabotage. There was an explosion, okay. and the bridge was damaged not collapsed and uh, it was a very interesting uh, attack allegedly by the ukrainians although no official confirmation it's interesting and you have to understand the context because the nuance here might avoid western audience the reason they chose this bridge is a very particular reason and i understand why so this bridge obviously this part people i think understand has very intense significance as far as a military asset if uh, Russia is fighting, if you can imagine Ukraine, there's the whole west side of Ukraine, which is absolutely right now has nothing to do with the war. And then there's the whole eastern side of Ukraine, which is where everything right now is going on, which is the four regions that are in dispute, the Donbass area and Crimea. And the, the only way for Russia to come into Crimea, which is to the to that region, is through that bridge. Okay. So the whole military logistical system infrastructure of the Russian military is going through that bridge. So bombing it or sabotaging it serves quite significant strategic purposes. And it was done also symbolically. You have to understand that a few days ago, we heard, or rather I think a few, couple of weeks already ago, we heard that Russia has officially annexed 
the mm-hmm. Donbas area. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Donbas is actually an abbreviation. It's uh, Donetsky Basin. <laughs> Donetsky Basin means uh, the pool of Donetsk. Donetsk is one of those regions. And anyways, so even some Russians don't even know that. But anyways, so Russia announces, hey, we're annexing this region. And then the only landline to that to Crimea gets bombarded and sabotaged by the Ukrainians. It's almost kind of the symbolic act to show, no, you guys don't control it. It's it's ours. Gotcha. Okay. So there's logistical aspects, there's symbolic aspects. Now, what people need to understand that this was performed intentionally at about 5 a.m. in the morning. So this was done intentionally not to have any loss of life, which it, it didn't have. It was a very uh, laser pinpoint uh, sabotage. Nobody mm-hmm. got killed. It was a strategic I, I would say legitimate military uh, action if you're trying to sabotage logistical uh, supply lines. Yes, it's civilian infrastructure per se, but I mean, the way it was carried out, it was very close to, you know, what would a moral strategic military offensive would look like. Okay. Yes, we destroyed some uh, land, strategic logistics uh, infrastructure. Nobody got hurt. And then what happened, which you just talked about, Matt, is the response from Russia, you could, you could, if you show you Putin, right, you could say, well, I'm going to come back with some really great way to get them back. I'm going to be cunning. I'm going to, I'm going to show how, because the Ukrainians show a lot of initiative, a lot of cunningness. There's just the um, organizational execution on this. It's not an easy thing to have done. They shown a lot of skill set and execution skills to do that. So you would say, well, Putin's going to come up with something crazy to embarrass them. And uh, the response was, yeah, let's shoot some cruise missiles into residential buildings in the center of few huge Ukrainian cities, mm-hmm. which absolutely serve. I mean, it's just straight up. Let's just bombard defenseless civilians with this zero military relevance. There's no logistical aspects. There's absolutely this deliberate kind of bombarding of civilians just to uh, say, well, I'm going to retaliate. So it's such a beyond the fact that it's horrific and uh, it's it's it's. I think it's war crimes, but I think it also shows some such lack of sophistication. Now you can understand why they got stuck in the Ukrainian mud because it seems like they have no creativity. I mean, that they, they came up with this. Mm. It's like so. It also you have to understand why this happened. So uh, I don't know if you heard, but the Russians actually replaced the boss in the so the Ukrainian branch of the Russian military has their own kind of leader in command. And Putin fired that guy and mm-hmm. he replaced him just a couple of days ago. The replacement is a guy uh, by the name of uh, Sergei uh, Serovikin. Uh, and uh, this guy, he was imported from Syria. He was the commander of the Russian forces in Syria. And I don't know how much you know about what happened in Syria, but ma- basically the Russian military did uh, atrocious war crimes in Syria. They bombarded the civilian targets. Oh, they wow. used biological weapons against civilians and absolutely just uh, they did everything they they had to to preserve the ruler of syria so he doesn't get overthrown but basically it's like horrific uh, mass Holy cow so basically you can you, you know guys do your own research google what happened in syria and russian military but he brought that guy in and now you see the response to what happened with the crimean bridge and they're like oh yeah that's that's par for the course for this guy because he's he brought him in to be this ruthless uh, absolute he doesn't give a shit so you can kind of see the response fits, you know, <laughs> right exactly with his kind of modus operandi. Now, the one thing I will say here, Matt, is like, look, I ask you a question. If you have a winning company, if you're winning operation, if you're winning a war, would you fire your chief of staff? Would you fire your head general? I mean, why did they replace him? Because like I hear a lot of people in mainstream media talk about, well, you know, m- you know what? Mainly on, on YouTube, there's a lot of channels talk. oh, Russia is winning and Ukrainians are losing. And then we'll talk about it in a second who's actually winning or not, because it's not that simple. But uh, if you're really winning and everything is great and Putin is playing everybody, you don't fire the guy in charge. Yeah. I mean, you don't fold just... a winning hand. You don't change things up. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You're not like up by 20 points and you basically say, well, this is not working out. I'm changing the coach. I mean, that's just, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as like... Uh, Who's actually winning this war? It's so complicated and it is absolutely terrifying. And I'll tell you why I'm scared to death about what's going on right now in Ukraine. Because some people in the U.S. may say, well, why do we care about what happens in Ukraine? Well, you care because, look, there is. I'm, just, I'm not going to talk about Ukrainians 
by the way, we can talk about historically why we should care, but I mean, it's not that huge of a deal. Like the US and NATO basically convinced Ukraine to give up their own nuclear arsenal uh, in 1994 in in kind of exchange for for assurances that if Russia ever attacks them, they'll be they'll be protected. Okay. Which obviously we f- we fucked them on that. But it, you know it is what it is. It's not yeah. the first country we fucked. Um, it, it happens all the time. I mean, uh, it's it's kind of it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Now, what's happening right now on the ground is is very interesting because the entire war right now is being fought. Uh, if you have in front of you the map of Ukraine, maybe we can add it in in post. I yep. don't know. Well, do. so you can show on the map the whole eastern side of Ukraine. There's literally four areas uh, where this uh, war right now is going on. Um, it's not being fought in Crimea, by the way. Uh, which has been annexed uh, to Russia since 2014. It's been fought in in other four regions. And right now, uh, basically, Ukrainians had this massive momentum over the past few weeks, and it kind of slowed down um, just over the past few days. They, you know, they're a little bit uh, slowing down, but they're taking a huge chunk uh, out of uh, Kherson, they're getting on on uh, some achievements in Lugansk or Luhansk, like they say it, right? Um, on the other hand, the Russians hold other two regions where there's absolutely no Ukrainian progression, and they're trying to move their forces, push up a little bit. They can't break through Ukrainian defenses. So it's kind of shaping up to this kind of Mexican standoff. You have these four regions. Ukrainians have moved up, and now they got a little bit stuck. The Russians are on their heels because they're absolutely getting crushed. But uh, nobody can actually break the stalemate. So this is becoming this kind of crazy attrition war. Um, now, I think that makes, man, if you ask me, and that's relevant for U.S. markets, the possibility of this war ending in 2022, given everything I just told you, would be highly unlikely. Okay. Um, Unless we can get a peace deal going, but at this point, it seems that first and foremost, the Ukrainians are not interested without getting back the Donbass area and Crimea. They want it all back mm-hmm. and basically saying, we're not going to negotiate. It's our land, blah, 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 whatever. Right. And it's there within the right to do it. I mean, I'm not going to say here that, you know, it is what it is. And uh, so their messaging is pretty much, yeah, it's non negotiable. We're not going to give up anything up. Now they're looking at this uh, and they're saying, well, look, like uh, when the war started, we had, you know, 200,000 uh, uh, military personnel, mostly comb- combatants, right? Right now, Ukrainian army has ballooned all the way up to 700,000 uh, uh, soldiers. Wow. Um, a lot of it is reservists. A lot of it is volunteers. So I would say the vast majority of these extra 500 that joined, they need serious training, they need serious support logistically. They need gear. They need equipment. They need technology. So that 700 needs to be equipped and needs to be trained. So before Ukraine like can actually go on the real counteroffensive and like go go and actually match up with what's going on right now on the ground, they need to go through months of preparation, which they're not ready right now for that. Uh, there's no real counteroffensive they can do with those 700. They can hold positions, but not anything beyond that. Um, they, they, the messaging that's coming out of Ukraine right now is basically, well, in 2023, we're going to push up and we're going to basically take uh, the the northern side of these four regions, which is uh, Kherson, and we'll take uh, Luhansk, and then we're going to push down on the south and basically go all the way to Crimea. Um, I find it hard to see as far as the way things stand right now, and I'll tell you why. And this is the part that scares me a lot. There's no good ending for this for us because whether Ukraine loses or wins, we're absolutely screwed. And uh, this is the part that you don't get to hear on social media because everybody is pushing an agenda for clicks. Some pushing an agenda that Ukraine is absolutely crushing the Russians, which is false. Some are pushing the narrative, oh, the Russians are winning and uh, this is just lies on CNN, also false. Uh, some pushing the the narrative that uh, the U.S. wants this war, which is absolutely again false. Some are pushing the narrative that the uh, Ukrainians uh, have been absolutely 100% innocent, and Russians are the you know the absolute utmost evil. Again, everything is just it, there's no nuance on mainstream media. Everything is just this fucking one and zero, black and white. And people fucking lost their ability to think in a nuanced way. Yeah. The reality of this situation is that 
if Ukraine keeps pushing up, first of all, they'll have to deal with an extra 300,000 people that Russia just recruited. They will be trained. They will be they will be going to the to the front, and it's going to be another three hundred thousand bodies. Probably not quality soldiers, no experience, low morale, lo, you know, logistically impaired. But still, three hundred thousand bodies. It's a lot to handle. Also, they'll have to w- handle the winter, which is going to be fucking. A, in, you know, Russian winter is something different, bro. Even Canadians, you guys don't know how bad this thing <laughs> is. Um, but let's say they handle this. You mm-hmm. have to understand that for Putin, losing Crimea. It's not only the end of his political reign, de facto. It's it's a real risk to his life. Because like if he cannot afford to lose this war, it's not like in the US where he loses and just you know somebody else will take over. If he loses, he's pretty much fucked. So there's no losing scenario for him. It's he's he's basically and it's an existential war. At this point, he got himself into a corner. He did it to himself, it's self-inflicted, but he created a situation where this is for him an existential war. Mm. With absolutely, he didn't have to. He fell into the you know this trap and uh, he fucked up. But now he's, he has no chance of not winning. So that is something you have to consider, and we'll talk about in a second. But there's also a whole different aspect which we haven't even talked about, and you barely see this in mainstream media. But um, Russia pretty much um, controls uh, Bela- Belarus. So mm-hmm. Belarus, for all intents and purposes, is no longer an independent country, only on on, on paper. Yeah. So there can be always a second front from the north of Ukraine through Belarus. And there is no Ukrainian military in that part of Ukraine anyways, because everybody is on the eastern front. Mm-hmm. So a second front for them would be, I would say, gen- gently, very hard to defend. And also, we just saw it today. Uh, Russia has a shit ton of cruise missiles. They can literally hit any point in, in Ukraine. It's thousands of kilometers of range. And they can rain help on on the on civilians, which I don't I don't know how much of it would be palatable. Ukraine doesn't have anything close to that. I mean, their weaponry is probably in the hundreds of kilometers range max. Uh, so you have to question: Well, if this goes south for Russia, will Putin actually have to, in his mind, use tactical nukes mm. to regain advantage on the ground? And if this motherfucker does that, that's pretty much opening up the gateway to hell because you don't know, like once you open up that can of worms, you don't know what the ending is going to be. And the the I don't think we've ever been this close, maybe except for uh, for you know for the Cuba missile crisis, we've never been this close to a nuclear freaking holocaust. It's absolutely insane that uh, this is about to happen. So for me. Uh, getting a peace deal done and stopping this before it gets out of hand is a priority. And I don't really care about virtue signaling about who's right and who's wrong. Mm. This has to stop. Like, because the alternative, like people are fuck around with this and they don't understand. Because I see this on Twitter and people are like, well, you know, you you have to stand up to bullies. I get it, motherfucker. But you guys are playing with fire. This isn't something just, you know, well, we just, uh, we call this bluff. I don't want to call it like it's not that kind of situation. It's it's you cannot like Russia and the US can never be in directly in conflict and they can never be any sort of nuclear uh, weaponry um, involved in the process because this is essentially for all intents purposes, the end of humanity as we know it. Yeah. So that being on the on the other side of it, uh, I think that, you know, it's funny how. Uh, people on the left side of the map has now gone like full like warmongering basically yeah let's like motherfuckers like this is a very delicate situation i mean i get it that ukraine doesn't want a peace settlement because they'll have to give something up for sure but i mean i'm looking at this as a citizen of the world and i don't want to fucking have a nuclear world war three and if this shit continues it's getting absolutely dicey and the uh, no at some point you lose control of this this isn't a joke this isn't a video game yeah i um Whenever I see, and it really has been picking up, at first there was those fears in February of like, man, that's Russia, like what's going on? But now it's almost a renewed and probably a fair fear. And I just keep thinking of this quote from Einstein when he was working on the Manhattan Project. He, the famous quote is, I have no clue what World War III will be fought with, but I can guarantee World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. As in our technology really at taking lives has gotten so advanced so good that it's something i agree with you it's not something to 
virtue signal or because at a certain point, if it takes that bad turn, there's no one to virtue signal for. There's no bullies to fight. There's no one to defend. It's done. The game is over. It's and I, I don't think people have that foresight. And like you said, for many things in life, we get away with virtue signaling on this, on that. But this is one of those things where we're talking about like global ramifications to the scale that I, I don't think people are truly internalizing. And obviously, like, I don't know, it, it seems like we're all trying to go, what's the fastest solution without with the least amount of bloodshed. And then that kind of brings me to a recent thing that really took, I guess, social media by storm. And that was Elon yeah. Musk and his tweets. And that was one that really kind of eluded me. I wasn't really understanding the anger because I'll throw that up on the screen right now. And then the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, he said, like, which one do you like, the Elon who supports Ukraine or Russia? And to me, it maybe I'm missing something. And please correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't interpret Elon's commentary as supporting Russia. I think he was saying, hey, I don't want us to all die. Um, and yep. granted, hey, I'm 28. I'm not from Russia or Ukraine or Crimea. So like, I'm not, by all, by all means, I'll be the first to admit I'm not the person to talk about it. But still, I, I just didn't understand it. So I would love to hear your thoughts on Elon Zelensky's response. And then just kind of, it seems like that sentiment of like, let's just try to get to the fastest end is almost kind of what you're trying to say here. Yeah, his uh, proposal got absolutely uh, misconstrued, and uh, because uh, I think, like at this point, we're we're losing our ability to have nuanced discussion. Remember when I said in the beginning, it, it like social media is basically where I think it started, and now you can see it playing out. So Elon comes out with this proposal, and we'll talk about it in a second. But basically, he says whatever he says, and then everybody's going, well, you hate Ukraine. And like, that was the Zelensky response. And a lot of people fuck with that. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, Elon, what the fuck are you doing? Even you have like smart people like Bill Ackman on social media basically saying, yeah, we shouldn't like give in to, we shouldn't give Russia anything. Okay, so I agree with you 100%. When I read his tweet, I was like, it's not about Russia. It's not about Ukraine. This proposal is the fastest way to stop this from escalating because if it escalates we have no way to stop it we don't know how far this will go like imagine like if i ask a politician a u.s politician what would be the u.s response if putin uses a tactical nuke in ukraine mm -hmm. like a, that's a question like do you want to answer this question nobody wants to answer that yeah. question so but so so let's let's consider the facts so Elon is basically saying, look, guys, this is getting out of hand. Yes, like, I understand what's going on. It's a tough situation. But he's basically saying, look, in, there has to be a compromise to stop this from moving forward. And yes, in any compromise, there's not going to be anybody who's going to be 100% happy with it. Uh, the compromise that he offered offers definitely... Uh, how should I put it? It offers a way out of this, but at a cost. And the Ukrainians are basically saying, well, we don't want to pay the price. Why should we pay the price for global, for saving the world? Well, it. I feel like it's not the right question. It's not why you should pay the price. This is, it is what it is. The situation as such on the ground is that Putin took over these parts of Ukraine, that Putin politically cannot give them up uh, for his own political reasons. Uh, trust me, if he could turn back the clock of time, this shit doesn't even start. It, he, he, it, it's a horrible decision on his part. But he's stuck in this political uh, situation. He cannot just give it up, especially after annexing these parts. It's going to look like, like for him, it's un, it's unacceptable. It's it's the end of his career, the end of his life. And in Russia, that's kind of how it goes together for, for these dictators. So Elon is saying, look, Putin isn't going to give up on these uh, these annexed areas. The Ukrainians are not going to give up on it because it's their land and their right, right? So what's going to happen? They're going to keep butting hands until some idiot accidentally launches a nuke or some crazy shit happens or whatever. Some, something leads to this absolutely catastrophe. So he's basically saying, look, let's give Russia this eastern part of Ukraine, this uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, whatever, right? It's heavily settled by Russians. I wanted There's to ask about that. Of... Like culturally, I was reading yes. that like, a lot of them culturally identify as yes, Russian as opposed to that's Ukrainian. True. Elon okay. is right about that. 
a lot of people are gonna hate on me for saying this, and you know, fuck it, I don't care, I don't give a shit. Uh, it's like I tend to subscribe to the idea is uh, you know, a year after you die, nobody even remembers who the fuck you were. Like even most of your family, like you already moved on. <laughs> I'm not about to give a fuck about what people say about me on Twitter, so you know, I don't give a shit. Uh, he was a hundred percent right on that. The Donbass area, the Crimea, yes, it is, uh, it is Ukrainian by by international law, and this was a sovereign sovereign state borders. International laws wise, Russia is absolutely 100% wrong. So there's no two ways about it. But culturally speaking, Crimea was originally not Ukrainian. Crimea was uh, granted to Ukraine by Nikita Khrushchev, uh, I would say like what, 50 or 60 years ago. It didn't really matter. It was a symbolic act since back in the do those days, y Ukraine was part of the USSR. It was pretty much... Uh, it was kind of this very symbolic act that had zero <laughs> zero implications. So Ukraine got Crimea because Khrushchev had the fucking brain fart. And uh, it just kind of just went. It's all like it's mainly Russians. Even like people from Ukraine. And again, they'll have to admit it. But what's happening right now is like before the war, Ukraine culturally was a very divided country. So that area, the Donbass area and Crimea is mainly Russian oriented. They speak the Russian language mainly. They, the culture is Russian. The Western part of the country, they speak a whole different language. It's a Ukrainian language. It's a different culture. And there's this. there was always a power struggle in Ukraine, which culture gets to win. For example, uh, um, if you go back and watch old clips of Zelensky, the president, he spoke Russian. Oh. He, he, he didn't speak Ukrainian. Like uh, now he speaks Ukrainian because it's kind of it's symbolic, but like go back to old clips, he's speaking Russian. He's like his concerts and shit. Like it's all in fucking Russian. Wow. Okay. That's so, so, something I feel like as a typical American, we wouldn't know like at all. Yeah. yeah so I think, uh, I, I don't know, but I think he learned Ukrainian. <laughs> like it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a secret. I think it's known. Uh, I think Zelensky had to learn Ukrainian when he got elected. Because wow. like he's not culturally like origin, like, pro, like, like that oriented with the Ukraine. So there was a cultural struggle inside Ukraine anyways. There was political people who were supportive for pro, pro Russian culture, pro Ukrainian culture. And at some point the, the, there was this uh, way wave where the Ukrainian side of, of the politics basically said, no, 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 we have the majority. We get to decide, you know, we're banning this from, you know, from public uh, use, blah, blah, whatever. So there was a the cultural aspect of it. The Eastern part of Ukraine there's definitely Ukrainians, like culturally Ukrainians who live there, but it's heavily populated by Russian people. So definitely Crimea as well. So that part, Elon, is 100% spot on. So if you actually, I think if you actually hold a referendum there, I don't know, this referendum was a bunch of horse shit. Bro. I don't, I don't, this referendum is illegal and it absolutely has no, uh, it's bullshit. You know, you don't hold a referendum on gunpoint. But if you actually had like a proper like a referendum in those regions, there's a good chance that uh, they would vote to go to Russia. Like oh. without even, even if it was the internal Ukrainian thing, just so you know. So Elon is spot on on that. So culturally, there's, there's, you're not going to be forcing, uh, you know, a, a completely Ukrainian part of the country to, to become part of it. So it's, it's, he's right on that. Now he's basically saying, look, it's a painful compromise, but it's one that has to be made for the benefit of us not going to World War III with nukes. Yes, it sucks, but it has to be done. And yes, you guys are getting to pay the price. It is what it is. I mean, sorry, but not sorry. I'm not, a, he's basically what he's saying, right? I, it's not about you or them. It's about this thing has to stop right now. And he's basically saying, well, look, uh, you don't basically block the water uh, to, to these areas. There's going to be Russian from now. Russia is going to take over the regions and we just stop this right now. No more bloodshed, no more risk of nuclear warfare. It's a fucking, it's a horrible compromise, but the alternative of, of this horrible compromise is even worse. Mm. And people focus, well, it's a horrible compromise. Yes, they go on Twitter and say, it's a horrible, yes, it is a horrible compromise. Nobody has argued otherwise. It's not like Elon saying, well, this is a great solution. No, motherfucker. It's a fucking shitty solution and it's not fair. It's absolutely not fair to Ukrainians. But the alternative of a nuclear warfare is absolutely unacceptable. And people will go like, well, if you give in to this bully right now, what prevents... Like, Bro, I'm not in that space right now. I'm in this 
like one minute to midnight on that clock yeah. of new of new of a nuclear disaster. Doomsday, I'm not about to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna test this right now. Let's. This is like people bring up Hitler and shit. Like this isn't the same, bro. Hitler didn't have fucking nukes. It's a whole different situation, bro. Mm-hmm. Let's just survive 2022 right now. How about that? That's what Elon's been saying. Let's survive 2022. That was the whole compromise. Yeah. And see if we can fucking find a way out of this fucking mess. And people went at his neck for this. Yeah. Basically saying, well, this anti-Ukrainian. This, come on. This nuance. Nuance is cap- uh, nuance is dead, bro. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You, you, that just doesn't exist in the social media yep. digital forum anymore. But with all of that and for good reason, like I think there is some negative sentiment to this. So in your own opinion, and obviously neither of us are clairvoyant here, but how do you see it playing out in 2023? Like I, I'm going to be optimistic that we get to that point. So how do you see it playing out not only on the geopolitical scale, but I'm sure some of the people tuning in right now, they're like, okay, well, if there is still an economy and in a market to worry about, what yeah. are your opinions there? I think that the, even if the if they find a way out of this war, which I hope they can, and I think uh, we cannot uh, forget the responsibility of the U.S. here. So the U.S. has to play a major role in putting pressure on on uh, on on Ukraine to actually find a way out of this, because right now it's kind of uh, weird. I think the U.S. is getting a lot of flack for that as well. People are saying, "Well, the U.S. wants this war because they're not putting pressure on Ukraine to to stop this." I mean. I think the US at some point will have to put the basically say, well, enough is enough. Because uh, it's a very dangerous game. Like they're looking at this, they're saying, oh, you know, let's 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 stick it to Putin a few more times before we close the sh- close shop, right? And uh, they have to finish this. Um, now, as far as what happens with the stock market, look, even if we ignore this, if even if we ignore the tensions in Taiwan and China, let's just talk straight up about the market. I mean, there's nothing to be optimistic about. Inflation is still four times higher than the benchmark. It's going to take a while for it to come down. We just saw the job numbers come out. And I made a little video about it on my second channel. Basically said, well, this is just kind of being like being in the boxing ring with fucking prime Mike Tyson. You're getting beat up and then you throw your best three punches and you connect right to his face. Like boom, boom, boom. You just throw 0.75, 0.75, (laughs) 0.75. And the motherfucker just smiles back at you, comes out with his job numbers, like fucking nothing. And I didn't feel that. And it's like, what the fuck do you do at this point? He's basically like, oh, shit. So with the job numbers that came out, it's clear that 4.5% isn't going to cut it, not even close. Mm-hmm. So basically now we know more rate, more rate hikes are coming. We know more money will be sucked out of the market. They'll actually have to clear the balance sheet, which they avoided so far from doing. They only talked about it, but you know, they obviously they avoided it because that's going to be the real pain. So a lot of companies will go into in, into a very bad place. If you have leverage, which at this point, why wouldn't you? Money was basically free. So mm-hmm. everybody loaded up on free money. So if you are stuck in a position with a lot of leverage, a lot of growth, very few revenues, you're going to have a very tough time in this economy with high interest environment. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you heard this, but Kathy Wood is actually sending letters now to the, to the Fed. <laughs> like, yeah. Don't, don't, are you killing me? What are you doing? He's like, you know, this is, she's not doing that for, you know, for the kindest. Unlike Elon, that's not a humanity driven request. Uh, she's getting annihilated. She's talking about looking book at, for sure. Yeah. So, like, without a doubt. Now, even look, and you're seeing what's, look, AMD missed revenues by 20%. I mean, yeah. AMD is like fucking, it's like, it's like LeBron level of companies, like right up there. So they don't fucking miss like that. Uh, iPhones aren't selling as good. It's like the holy grail, like a cult brand, like everybody. Like iPhones, Apple has been selling the same fucking phone every year, like a fucking uh, like hotcakes. It's all of a sudden it's not selling as much as they thought. And we can go down the list. Like it's, a lot of companies are announcing potential layoffs. So the job numbers might be a little bit lagging in that aspect. So maybe things are moving. But it's just basically I look at this market and say, well, where is the redemption going to come from? If they will keep raising rates, if if profit margins are getting eroded by inflation, if the job market will actually eventually start to slow down, where is this positive catalyst coming from? Uh, you just saw OPEC basically show you what's going to happen in the next year. As demand slows for oil, it's all they need is a button to, mm. pop, to push it back up. You saw what happened in the OPEC plus decision. Oil dropped below 80, went down to 70. Boom, they announced they're cutting production. 
price goes up. So OPEC isn't gonna down gonna go down just laying down saying, oh yeah, we'll just let oil go back down to $30. They're they're not gonna do that. It's not that simple. Uh, OPEC OPEC controls a third of the world's oil production. And uh, they don't even include Russia, which Russia on its own is another 10 million barrels. Uh, so between all of OPEC plus the US and Canada, there's that's pretty much it. Um now so if OPEC has full intentions of keeping the energy prices elevated, which I can totally understand why they want to do that, that means that inflation isn't going to come down so fast because the only thing that drove inflation down the less CPI, as you probably remember, right, it was just pretty much energy because we released a whole bunch of SPRs and now that thing is going to, you know, how long can you do that? So like, where's, I don't see a positive catalyst. I think 2023 is going to be a fucking horrendous year. For, for the economy. And I think the stock market is not going to be in the vacuum where it doesn't impact. Um, profit margins will go down. Revenues will go down. Multiples will shrink. And uh, I think if you go back in history, look, Matt, you're, you're younger than me, but you've done your research. Like in 2000, we had almost 80% rawdown. 2008, like 60% rawdown. We're nowhere close to that. People don't understand what pain is. And I think there's much more pain ahead. Yeah, I mean, as of the point that we're filming this, we're about down 24-ish percent uh, year to date. So basically from the all-time high, uh, from a theoretical standpoint, it could obviously get a lot worse. And I don't want to necessarily open this can of worms right now. But the thing that scares me is like, it's easy to talk about companies because people recognize the pseudo celebrity CEOs. We recognize a product, um, but the bonds world, is it boring? Yeah, but what we're seeing happening in bonds right now it is truly a historic event. And the fact that right now the Bank of England is doing everything they can to keep gilts up and it's just not doing anything. We know they are buying billions a day and their yep. bonds are still coming apart. And like I said, that's a whole nother multi-hour discussion. It's scary right now. And that's and a Hail Mary, bro. That's a Hail <laughs> uh, If they're doing that, that's a Hail That makes me just think we, don't, we yeah. lost control of this. And I guess to give a little framework to this long term on, let's just say the caveat that the world survives long term, I'm definitely going to be a permable and I'm I'm not calling it out to be like the Japanese market where necessarily it doesn't come back. Like, I do think we see another high. I just don't think it's going to be one of these things of like, oh, a couple months and then we're like scot free. Like, I don't think that I agree with you that I think the bottom comes somewhere in 2023. And it's yep. just a question Agreed. of how bad. So to the viewers watching this, we're not financial advisors. Obviously, do what you can do your own DD. But I view it as a game of load up the cash that you can and wait to buy those things that you love on an extraordinary discount. That's how I'm viewing the current situation. And for me, it's a game of following the trend, not trying to bottom tick or top tick. I'm going to wait until the Fed is done with the game that they're currently playing. And if anyone looks at the chart of the pandemic yep. versus now, it's all the Fed. Quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. As soon as we hear that it's finally over, that's the time to buy and just like kick back and relax and watch your long-term portfolio grow. And the thing to remember is like people talk about, okay, so it takes about... Uh, 10, 10 months on average, if you go like somebody did the math on the on the last like 50 crashes, it took about 10 months okay. from the all time high to hit the all time low. Sorry, the, yeah. the bottom, uh, but they they haven't measured how long it takes from the bottom to go back up. Mm. And uh, it's very different. Like if you go back in 2008, it took a year and a half to go okay. back up in 2000, it took almost 15 years for companies to go to bounce back up. So you never know if you're getting like a lost decade kind of situation. But even if you are, even at the worst case scenario, if you're getting a lost decade here, if your investment horizon is is uh, 20 years and upwards, and there's a absolutely no way the S&P 500, at least historically speaking, ever in, since existence, it it it's just impossible to to lose money staying in the S&P 500 for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has never happened. I mean, and, and the only way to lose money is to try to jump in, jump out, and uh, be erratic about it. Now, uh, so, but look, there's if you are staying in the market, I think that the vir the ultimate virtue is patience, mm -hmm. and it's harder. It's it's easy. It's easier said than done, right? But uh, if you choose to DCA and stay, I'll tell you two things. Number one. You have to be disciplined, like an offensive lineman on football. If you if you flinch, you're fucked. <laughs> that's a penalty, right? And number two, uh, if you DCA and that's that's your strategy, you have to uh, uh, accept the fact 
that uh, it's going to be painful for a while and and just take it as part of uh, part of reality and not worry about it too much because the alternative is basically even if you jump out right now let's say that we're seeing a crisis coming in next year right let's say you time somewhat time the exit point how would you time the re-entry point yeah. you're flying vertigo in darkness there's no reference point you have no idea which way is up or down like so how would you re-enter like, okay let's say you got out on time it's a very complicated game so mm. uh i i would just say that i'm not looking at the market i'm doing what you're doing yes i'm looking at the interest rates i'm looking at inflation i'm looking at what the government is doing i'm looking at what the fed is doing i'm looking at geopolitics when i see that the conditions for for recovery uh, have have ripened mm-hmm. then i'm going to jump back in regardless of how good or bad the stock market is going to look like at that point i think those are definitely some useful insights yeah. i actually think that's a perfect moment to kind of wrap this all up just so everyone knows this is mr tom nash i will put his youtube channel and his twitter in the description of this video so you can easily track him down but overall i truly appreciate your time and i appreciate you kind of giving a little bit more insight to someone who like understands the culture because i think some of those nuanced points that we keep coming back to are easily missed by the American public just because it's not something we've ever really uh, dealt with growing up. But overall, I truly appreciate your time. Uh, do you have anything to say to wrap this up? Yeah, we need to finish this uh, violent cycle and just go back to going to work, making money, go back home, have sex with your wife, do it again the next day and not worry about the nuclear war. Uh, definitely some wise words. I appreciate that. As always, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon.